I am very excited to welcome to the stage our next keynote speaker, who is an expert on the ways that integrative approaches in medicine can be used uh, wisely to keep people well. I'd like to introduce Dr. Wayne Jonas. He is the executive <coughs> director of the Samueli Integrative Health Programs at the Samueli Foundation. Dr. Jonas is a practicing family physician. <clears throat> He's an esteemed researcher and a retired lieutenant colonel in the Medical Corps of the U.S. Army. From 2001 to 2016, he was president and chief executive officer of the Samueli Institute, a nonprofit medical research organization. Earlier in his career, Dr. Jonas was the director of the Office of Alternative Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians and the author of the forthcoming book, how Healing Works. Let's give a big hand for Dr. Wayne Jonas. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me all right? Great. Well, it's, I really appreciate uh, being sandwiched between the illustrious panel of major systems that are delivering innovation and the speaker that follows me from the technology world. Uh, I'm sandwiched in between that. Uh, I work for the Samueli Foundation. It was founded and is funded by Henry and Susan Samueli. Henry Samueli uh, started the company Broadcom, a tech company, and now they're focused uh, a lot of their philanthropy and efforts, uh, social impact investing on health and healthcare, especially integrative health, which was Susan's passion. So I think I'm appropriately placed in this, uh, in this conference uh, to bridge those two. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, and what I'd like to do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so is reframe the question that is normally asked around healthcare reform. Um, the question that is being batted about, uh, both in Congress and elsewhere, is really about who pays for what we currently do. And it's become largely a shell game, because we're all paying in many ways, and I think because of that, it really is the wrong question to ask. We need to be asking the question of how do we get more health, and the healthcare innovators need to be asking what is the role of healthcare systems in creating health. If we don't shift to that question, we're going to find no matter who's paying, that the costs will continue to go up, the outcomes will continue to go down, and burnout won't just apply to the frontline folks in primary care and emergency medicine. We're all going to get burned out. I want to illustrate that with uh, a patient that I had uh, that is a typical patient that I see every day in the office. I'll call her Sally. She was an executive vice president, uh, very hard-charging um, uh, executive. Uh, and she was rushing from one meeting to another when she got into a car accident. She rear-ended somebody. It looked to be fairly minor. She was taken to the emergency room, had a number of tests done. They didn't see any major injuries. But her back hurt, and they put her on non-steroidals and sent her to me. So I saw her in the clinic, and I refilled her non-steroidals and sent her to physical therapy. She went to physical therapy, started to take the pain medications, and uh, began to get better, um, not completely. And then about five weeks later, she was picking up a suitcase uh, to go on another business trip, and as she said, something popped, doctor. Typical way patients will describe that. I couldn't stand up. It was excruciating. She called the ambulance, she was taken via the emergency room, uh, she got more tests, and this time was prescribed opioids. So now she's on non-steroidals and on opioids, and she comes in to me, and I say, let's do some more physical therapy and try some other things out. And I add typical things on, like, not, like TENS units, electrical stimulation. Uh, she had a couple injections into the pain areas. We sent her over to the surgeon, and the surgeon looked at her and said, no, nah, not a surgical candidate. It's musculoskeletal, as 85% of back pain is. But this time, she didn't get better. She kept coming back in, and we kept trying out a lot of different things. Finally, I sent her over to behavioral health. She didn't like that. Um, she got diagnosed with depression, and she was put on additional medications. We suggested that she go into an opioid recovery program. She didn't like that either. As she said to me in one of the visits, 
Doc, I'm not crazy and I'm not addicted. My back hurts. Unfortunately, Sally's case is very common. It seems like you can't wake up in the morning anymore without some president telling you that we're in the opioid crisis. I think in the last week we've had two presidents say that. And we are. 60% increase in the use of opioid. We just heard that discussed on the panel. Opioid-related deaths are expected to be near 60,000 this year. Huge problem. Almost 12 million people are misusing opioids of some type. Um, but I'm going to suggest to you that the focus on controlling and narrowing the opioid prescriptions, although important, is also misfocused, and it's a reflection of our misfocus on the overall health care reform system. Because by restricting the lens into these areas, we're missing the point, which is that we don't have so much an opioid problem, which is the tip of the iceberg. What we have is a chronic pain mismanagement problem. We're not appropriately managing uh, patients with non-drug approaches to chronic pain. Now, fortunately, a number of organizations have figured this out and have started to make recommendations that we start using non-pharmacological approaches to pain. American College of Physicians has come out with guidelines on that. The FDA, the CDC have all come out with guidelines emphasizing that. JCO has now said they're going to start looking for that in hospital accreditation. There are certain organizations that are actually moving to do something in their own systems. The DOD and the VA are some of the first out in those areas. They're actually implementing widespread non-pharmacological approaches, not just restricting uh, opioids in those areas. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. Now, patients have known this for a long time. If we'd listened to them two decades ago, <laughs> we would have learned that patients with chronic uh, pain have been using uh, complementary and integrative or alternative approaches uh, to the tune of 60 to 70 percent. And if your practitioners don't know about that, it's because they're not asking them. Therapeutic massage, yoga, acupuncture, spinal manipulation, mind-body practices are widespread and common, not just for pain, but 40 percent of the, the U.S. public uses these on a regular basis for other chronic illnesses and for prevention. Sally was taking some supplements that nobody knew about until I asked her that question. She'd also been to a yoga therapist and gotten injured and said, I'm not going back there again. We are leaving these patients to be the integrators between our conventional treatment-based system and their self-care and complementary medicine system. And they aren't necessarily doing a very good job of it. And it isn't their responsibility to be the integrator, it's our responsibility to do it in an evidence-based and responsible way. Why do we need to do this? That's because chronic pain is simply another tip of the iceberg around chronic disease management, which we're not doing very well. We have a tremendous system for managing acute illnesses and for the acute manifestations of chronic disease, but we're not uh, it's not adding value for the management of chronic disease. Here's just a little data that illustrates that. First, we're first in spending by far than any other country in healthcare. We're 37th in our health outcomes, according to WHO. We will soon have, be able to spend 25% of our GMP on medical treatment and healthcare, and there's increasing disparities over the last two decades. The National uh, Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Science, came out with a report in 2013, which is probably the best documentation of this, where they compared the healthcare trends for major chronic problems and behavioral and preventative problems on the top 16 rich countries were in that category. And they showed that compared to those top 16, we are declining in nine out of 11 major areas. Worse. We're getting worse. It's going down. Here's a list of some of those areas. This, I think, more than any other slide, illustrates the, the loss of value that our healthcare system is delivering now when it comes to health. This is graphing our uh, mortality in our population against healthcare costs compared to not just the rich countries, but a, a number of countries around the world. And as you can see, we are a major outlier. 
We, we pay almost double in healthcare costs, and yet we are below average life expectancy in most of the OCED rich countries, uh, down around the level of Portugal. We are losing value in these areas. We need to, as to paraphrase Einstein, we cannot get where we need to go, health, by doing the same thing that we're doing today, healthcare. We need to shift the focus. Well, where does the value come from? If we really wanted to actually create health, we would need to find out where that is. And we, also, we know where that is. We know, for example, that um, health, the population's health, uh, even if we had full payment for all health care, would only improve about 15 to 20%. The rest of health comes from outside of the office and outside of the clinic and outside of the hospital. A large chunk of it comes from behavior and lifestyle. Smoking, alcohol, stress, nutrition, movement, sleep. An equally large chunk of it comes from what we call the social determinants. These are enablers or inhibitors of the ability to get to the lifestyle issues. <laughs> Food deserts, for example, uh, unwalkable uh, areas, um, a lack of education, lack of access. And then the environment contributes that. So if we actually wanted to shift towards the value in healthcare, we would begin to move out of the office and into these areas to try to address those. Can we do that? Is it possible to do that? Well, this is a cultural issue, you say. It's really not in our hands. And yet we are the biggest influencers of health in the country. Over 90% of individuals will see a doctor or engage with the healthcare system every single year. And they pay attention to us. They ask us about these. All you have to do is watch the evening news. And they'll say, go ask your doctor. That's fine if it's a new drug, but if it's about how to cook properly, the doctor doesn't know. It's more than just about payment. It's about how we do research in these areas in health. And it's also about the communication of perception that we have with our patients in the office itself. When Sally came in, she was coming in and asking me to fix her. She'd been doing that for 10 years, which is why she was getting more and more, more modalities uh, on that. I needed to somehow change the conversation with her so that she understood the data that I've just shown you in terms of where healthcare comes from. And so I set up an appointment with her that I call a hope visit. We all do SOAP visits, right? Every time someone comes in, you have to write a SOAP note, Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. That's your diagnosis and treatment. Hopefully it's evidence-based. Uh, I do something called, after that, uh, a HOPE visit, healing-oriented uh, practices and environments. Uh, and instead of asking, what's the matter, Sally, I ask Sally, what matters to you? And when I asked that question to Sally, here's what she came out with. She said, well, the first thing she said is, I gotta figure out how to manage all these drugs. I can't take them all. This is what I do to manage my pain, that's what I do to manage my pain, et cetera. And it was all drug. I said, Sally, okay, that's actually not what I'm asking you about. I'm asking what do you do to improve your own health? What goes on in your life space that you do to increase your own health and well-being? She says, oh, why didn't you say that in the first place? I get up every morning and I get into a jacuzzi pool that my uh, husband and we bought together and I spend an hour in the hot water stretching. If I don't do that, I cannot get through the day. If I do do it, I'll probably get through lunch and maybe be able to take care of the two kids when they come home. She had two teenage kids. Heat and stretching, that's what she did. I said, that's great. What about your sleep? Oh, it's terrible. I'm up and down all night. I have chronic pain issues. I come up, I get up in the middle of the night to take my pain medication. Uh, she'd been educated in sleep hygiene and she'd been written a prescription uh, for a drug for sleep. She admitted it didn't work very well. I asked her about her stress. I don't have any stress, Doc. I used to be stressed when I was working, but now I don't do anything. I just sit around all day. I'm not stressed. I said, well, what do you do for stress management? Oh, well, I watch TV and have a couple drinks. Oh. She had an ignorance uh, around the perception of stress and didn't even realize that her pain was a huge source of stress, but she had no techniques for managing her own stress. 
I asked her, is there any place you can go in your house where, you know, you just feel well and you can sort of get away from it all and all that? She couldn't think of one. There wasn't a single place she could go where she could say, this is my space. She had no place to actually heal if she wanted to. And then towards the end, end of the, the, the interview, she said, I said, what's the biggest problem that you have? And she said, the biggest problem is that I can't work anymore. I used to be the breadwinner in this family. My husband and my kids used to joke and call me salary instead of Sally. <laughs> when they stopped doing that, I knew I was done. Armed with this information, we put together Sally's healthcare delivery team. Now, up to this point, she had a team. It was go to this specialist, it was go to that um, uh, treatment, et cetera, totally uncoordinated in those areas and all doing things to her. But now Sally's team looks a little bit different. We put together what I call an integrative health sal a team for Sally, and it involved her physician that helped coordinate her medical management, the conventional care that she was needing. It involved a pharmacologist, which we had in-house and on our team to help her manage her drugs and her supplements, which she had not told anybody about before. The behaviorist now had a little bit different role. It wasn't there to do psychotherapy, which she didn't want. It was actually to help her as a health coach, to identify particular behavioral changes that she could then accomplish and begin to implement into her life. We sent her to a yoga therapist, but it wasn't that any yoga therapist. It had to be somebody that was actually trained in good evidence-based yoga delivery for back pain and could deliver appropriate care integrated in with our team. So that's the one we had to reach out of the office to actually bring in because we didn't have a yoga therapist on our staff. The other two thing, people on her team or things on her team were her family because if her family wasn't involved in helping her find a space and create a place where she could heal. She couldn't actually bring this into her daily routine and her daily life. And then finally, her body. Sally had felt somehow that her body had betrayed her. It had interfered with a bit for her ability to do what she wanted to do in life. And boy, was she pissed at it. This didn't require psychotherapy. She wasn't going to do that anyway. But she sure needed to do something about that. And she began to journal about that very simple technique that helps people become aware of how they influence their own health and well-being. We shifted this dialogue with the team. This is a different type of health care. On the surface, it doesn't look much different than what I was doing before. She came in, she had full coverage, she saw the physician, she had the pharmacologist, etc. Uh, but it was focused completely differently. It was profoundly different. It was an integration of the conventional treatment that she had had for all those years with complementary approaches that she was using anyway and the evidence was now suggesting might be useful for her and self-care approaches to embed it into her life. This is what we call integrative health care. This is a new way to go about it. It isn't changing, in fact, what we pay for, although we'll talk a little bit about that, um, but it's actually rethinking the questions that we ask. Health and well-being uh, occur when we encourage and move towards self-care, when we integrate the three areas of conventional, complementary, and lifestyle. And the evidence shows that when the patient is engaged in that process and managing their own health care, they're healthier and they cost less. This is what integrative health care is about. Now, can we do this? Can we make this type of care routine in our own health care system? Is that possible? Well, I'm going to suggest that you come to the panel on Friday. Because on Friday, we have four illustrious group individuals and organizations that are doing just this. The first is Howard Federoff uh, from the University of California Irvine system that has uh, just been given a large grant to reframe their entire health sciences college, pharmacy, nursing, uh, um, medicine, and public health around an integrative approach like this. Um, we have uh, Mary Jo Kreitzer from the University of Minnesota who is doing this from a nursing practice special, uh, a, a specialist, reaching out into the community, especially in the lifestyle area. We have George Isham, uh, uh, co-chair of the uh, National Academy's Population Health Management Committee and a health partners executive who's going to talk about how health partners is doing this. 
And then finally, Gail Christopher, uh, formerly from the Kellogg Foundation, who worked in the community setting, in settings using integrative approaches for reducing health disparities and addressing issues such as racism in health. Come see the panel. There are systems that are, you can look to that are, as I say, boots on the ground, that are doing this, not just talking about it. And one that uh, I and my, coll my colleagues and I have, uh, have worked with for uh, many years is the military and the VA. The military is training, for example, all of their practitioners in something they call battlefield acupuncture. So this is a uh, simple ear technique. It doesn't actually use needles. It uses little studs. And they are training everybody who lays hands on patients with pain in this, from medics in the front office through primary care doctors, nurses, all the way up to pain specialists in those areas. They're also embedding mind-body techniques and technologies to enhance that. Uh, such as CES devices, heart rate biofeedback devices, as standard part of primary care. Uh, next year, the VA will announce the opening of 18 new centers of excellence in integrative care, uh, one in each, at least one in each vision where they're going to be implementing integrative care models in those areas. So stay tuned for that. We can learn from many of these areas. All right, who's going to pay for this? Well, you know what? We're all already paying for it. <laughs> we're paying because we're not doing it. Uh, healthcare cost management has, rightly so, focused on where most of the healthcare costs are, right? Which is in the advanced illness category. 50% of costs are coming from 5% of the population, and most of that from highly expensive inpatient or ED care. And so mitigating that is a, is a huge focus. Um, but patients like Sally fall below that. They're in the risk multiple chronic disease category, and they're the feeders up into that system. They're up feeders into those costs. Unless we can somehow reverse the, the trajectory that Sally was on, soon they will be up in that advanced care component and will be providing those kinds of costs. Uh, we need a system that actually can address that lower pyramid. And ultimately, we need a system that can address the ones below that, the healthy, because they're the actual feeders. <laughs> they're the ones that if we don't prevent the progression of illness uh, or prevent the illness in the first place, we're going to be up in the high cost category. And our system does a terrible job of prevention in those areas. Uh, and the shifting in costs are up and down this pyramid, aren't they? Can we do this? Yes, there's two ways to do it. I think one is already implemented and being implemented in what's called value-based care, but it's focused on the top part of the pyramid only, mostly. Uh, integrated care involves care coordination, preventing hospital admissions and readmissions, ED visits, uh, reducing the use of expensive specialists and laboratory prescription tests in those areas. Integrative health is going farther down on that pyramid. Wellness promotion, Again, through appropriate use of lab imaging and self-care components, preventative care, and lifestyle management. We need a system that has an integrated, integrative health system that is actually applying these principles to the entire healthcare system, not just to the top of the pyramid. Well, here we stand uh, with one foot in value-based care and one foot in volume-based care. In the new world and in the old world, we're trying to get into the boat, but we're actually straddling it, and that's creating a lot of stress. We need to be able to move over towards a more whole system, preventative, integrated approach. We need to get in the boat. And if we don't get in the boat pretty soon, we're going to fall in the water. And the innovators you've talked here, which are moving in that direction, some that you'll see on the panel on Friday, uh, are trying to do that. But we need to move it as quickly as possible. And we can't really wait for Washington to do it. So what can you do to make this happen now in your system? There's a number of ways that you can start now. You don't have to wait for Washington to do it. Uh, first of all, make sure you do good integrated coordinated care, the standard care that you have but in a much more integrated fashion than you have. Do what you're already doing in these areas, but do it in a coordinated and integrated fashion. Uh, and then second, add a few tools or a few concepts. I've mentioned the hope note, which is shifting the questions to actually now address where health comes from 
in the day-to-day -day office visit. Change that transaction. Add some simple methods, like I've talked about, the ear acupuncture, mind-body practices, and safe supplements to the program. Technologies and investing in advanced health technologies can markedly accel accelerate this. Uh, in the military, with the Navy, we have used, nobody wants to sit around doing mindfulness and meditation cross-legged, right? They're too restless for that. Uh, and so we create biofeedback devices that measures heart rate biofeedback, which is a measure of autonomic system balance and whether someone's actually in a relaxation response or not. And you can attach all kinds of games to that process. They love that. They compete with each other to see who can make the, uh, the, the balloon fly or kill the enemy uh, in a relaxed state. <laughs> Finally, take the teams that you have that are delivering care, but redesign them to focus on creating health. You can do it. You actually have most of these already in your portfolio. Add things like health coaching, team care, shared decision-making tools to those models. Now, I'm in the fortunate position for, uh, of having been funded by the Samueli Foundation, and I'm happy to see the director of the Samueli Foundation, uh, Gerald Solomon, is actually sitting right here. Wave your hand, uh, Gerald. Uh, and my team, who's actually creating a set of tools, um, uh, Doug and Jen, can you wave your hand? Are you over there somewhere? Okay, Jen is not, not in the room. Um, whose sole purpose uh, is to actually create tools to help you do this. So we're building uh, tools for physicians to immediately implement this in their practice, educational tools for patients so they can begin to understand where health comes from, uh, and healthcare system approaches. Uh, if you're interested in that, contact one of us, and we'd love to work with you to see about testing out some of the new models that you're doing using this new type of paradigm. So I want you to, uh, I got about, Four minutes left here, and I'm going to show you something. So I want everybody to stand up. This is called Three Minutes to Well-Being. Okay? And I will start exactly on time, because <laughs> I've got four minutes. <laughs> All right, I want you to take a big breath and put your hands up. Deep, deep breath into the belly. Put it up. Okay. Stretch really high. Okay, now go this way. Go that way. Blow it out. <sighs> Turn to your neighbor, shake their hand or fist bump. Say, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Smile. Smile. All right, you can sit down. You have just created wellness in less than a minute. Your immune system is working better. We can document that with uh, some of the genomic and immune measures. Uh, your brain is working better. Your psychological health is improved. And if you do that regularly uh, and incorporate some of the other tools that I've talked about, you're going to use less health care. You're going to prevent things. That's wellness in a nutshell. You can do this now. You don't have to wait for Washington to figure it out. But the need, the need to create more value in healthcare, it's not going to go away. I mean, you all deal with this every day. MACRA, MIPS, bundle care, population health, value-based healthcare, the triple aim, patient-centered care. Sally finally had somebody listening to her and letting her be in the driver's seat. Joy in medicine, the burnout issue, and other changes. Those are all here to stay. They're not going to go away no matter who's paying for what. You don't have to wait until the dust has settled in Washington to figure out which way to go. You can actually get in the boat right now, but you have to believe in the science. You have to believe in the science and the evidence as to where health actually comes from and move into that space. You need to pilot some of the tools that I've just mentioned in integrative health, like the Hope Note and others, uh, to test out how they would work in your system. Uh, and you need to come to Friday's panel. You'll be, presently, you'll be ple present, pleasantly surprised to see the transformation that will go on both in you and in your system if you do that. Healthcare reform starts right now, and it starts with you. Thank you. You got two minutes back. 